I want to thank Chief Val Demings for that very gracious introduction and uh, to bring special greetings to the president of this caucus, uh, the Honorable Crespo, and to the conference chair, uh, Mr. Kinsey, and to each of you. You know, in 1952, two 19-year-old musicians, uh, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, wrote a song uh, which was recorded on Fury Records. And the opening verse of the song says, I'm going to Kansas City. Kansas City, here I come. They've got a crazy way of loving there, and I'm going to get me some. I'll be standing on the corner of 12th Street and Vine with my Kansas City baby and a bottle of Kansas City wine. And you know, this song was recorded by a number of people, including the Beatles and James Brown. It was such a hit for James Brown that in his instructions for his funeral, he requested uh, that singer Marva Whitney sing Kansas City uh, at his funeral. And that happened in Augusta, Georgia in 2006. It was such a hit for James Brown uh, that he changed the lyrics just a little bit. He said, uh, you heard the original lyrics, there's a crazy way of loving there and I'm gonna get me some. James said that there are some crazy little women there and I'm gonna get me one. Now that was different for, for James to say he only wanted one, but he was going to Kansas City to find one. And James would do a spin and lean into the mic and say, uh, I might take a train, I might catch a plane, but even if I have to walk, I'm going there just the same. I'm going to Kansas City. Kansas City, here I come. And that song uh, was installed in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It won many Grammys. It is among the top 500 songs. It is now the official song of Kansas City. And what's interesting about the song is that the two 19-year-old musicians who wrote it had never been to Kansas City. <laughs> and so they could only imagine what they would find in Kansas City. They knew that it was the cradle of jazz, similar to Memphis, Tennessee, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, and they knew that there were all kinds of interesting things going on in Kansas City, but they had to imagine what they might see in Kansas City. And tonight I want you to imagine with me what you might see in Kansas City. And what you see in any city is determined by the leadership of the city and the imagination and the vision and the innovation of those leaders. So to tell you about some of the things that you would see in Kansas City today, I want to talk about one of the leaders who has left his mark on Kansas City. He was on the city council, as many of you are uh, now, and he became its first African-American mayor. He also understood your theme that we shall not be moved, looking at our past, and shaping our future. So when he was elected to the city council, when he served as mayor, he made it his mission. And in your program, it states that he was an unapologetic redevelopment advocate. And he looked at places that in many cities have disappeared. You know, all over the United States of America, through urban renewal, through revitalization, 
through gentrification, the evidence of the existence of African American people has been erased, has been bulldozed down. But you had a leader in Kansas City that made sure that that did not happen. And one of the things that he did uh, was to do what I call, he went back to fetch it. Have you all heard of the Sankofa bird, the Sankofa symbol? The bird looks back but moves ahead. So he went back to fetch it. He went back to 18th and Vine. 12th Street and Vine, 12th is no longer there. It has been replaced by a park, and there is a walkway through the park shaped in the form of a base uh, clebel, uh, uh, the, the symbol for, for music. And he had a lot to do with that park, and there are historic markers all over so that people understand uh, how Kansas City developed and who the people were who were instrumental uh, in that. He also, as a member of Congress, came up with the Green Impact Zone. And he looked at 150 blocks of declining urban core, and he brought home $125 million in American Recovery and Reinvestment Funds, the stimulus funds, a leader who understands bringing down federal dollars. Yeah. Now, I serve in the Florida Senate, and we were supposed to uh, be in session for 60 days. I go back Monday because we have gridlock because some people say we don't want any federal dollars. Well, the truth is, it's your money and my money, and we send it to the federal government every April 15th. And why not bring it back to take care of people in our community? So here we have a leader who understand understood bringing home federal dollars to address issues in his community. He understands revitalization. And with the green impact zone, uh, the objective there is to make this high crime area environmentally green. And I was with uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton yesterday, and we talked about the fact that we have Germany and Michigan generating more solar power than Florida. And we're the sunshine state. So help me understand what sense that makes. But we have a leader who understands the power of green. He also understands where we're going in terms of technology. And so he worked in his district uh, to create smart grid technology in most of the homes. Because when we talk about the digital divide, it is real. And so the vision of our speaker ended up making sure that in the inner city, there was this smart grid technology. He also understands that we have to claim where we come from. We can't have amnesia about where we come from. And so he is a United Methodist minister. And I imagine that he understands the passage in Joshua where uh, children were moving to freedom from one place to another. And as they got ready to cross the river, they were commanded to take some stones. Not pebbles, but stones and take them across the river and on the other side to build a monument. And generations later would ask, what mean ye by these stones? And you would be able to explain they are the evidence of how we got over. And so the evidence of how we got over is in Kansas City. 
and I am delighted to have him in my Senate District, Senate District 12. And I tell people that I represent Mickey and Minnie and Shamu and Harry Potter and 470,000 people. And so I am delighted, uh, Congressman Cleaver, to have you here before I go back to, ha uh, to Tallahassee. He represents Missouri's fifth congressional district, which is the home of Harry Truman. He is a member of the exclusive House Financial Services Committee. He's the ranking member of the subcommittee on housing and insurance, and also a senior whip of the Democratic Caucus. And during the, 20, the 112th Congress, he was elected unanimously the 20th chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Emanuel Cleaver. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Senator. <laughs> Reverend Senator Thompson uh, just delivered a powerful address. May I open now the doors of the church? Is that one? <laughs> Is that one? Uh, actually, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the whole talent involved in elocution uh, is something that goes way back into the history of African Americans. Uh, and it is, it is, not, it, it is not unusual uh, to have people who can just stand up and uh, wax eloquent, uh, as did Senator Thompson. She is. I would, I would want to be on her side of a debate uh, down in Tallahassee. And uh, I, I am pleased to be here uh, to uh, reacquaint myself with some uh, who I've known over the years and to uh, meet new uh, individuals who are making up the Democratic Party. And of course, I think that one of the things we have to do uh, is to grow bring more people in, uh, not keep others out. And uh, one of the things I'm so happy about is that Val Deming uh, is, is in uh, the Democratic Party. And my hope is that she will also eventually become uh, a part of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I, I'm not trying to start anything. I'm just. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Uh, so it's 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 also good to see her again, uh, as, as well as the the actually, uh, I, I think uh, your uh, Black Caucus uh, chair, uh, Henry Crespo, is someone who I think is known all around the the country as well, and he is. Uh, leading uh, anything that he's doing, he's leading well. Uh, and, and is always, uh, I think, deep in terms of his view of the politics. We, I was, we were having some conversation about things as they are uh, today uh, and, and things that I think we we're gonna, going to have to do. Uh, uh, there's a young lady here that I, whose family I've known uh, for decades. My wife grew up ne uh, next door to them. Uh, and, and so uh, Pam Keith, her, uh, her, fam her, her grandmother, Gertrude Keith, uh, was, is kind of a legendary uh, person in, in Kansas City. She is, uh, we, uh, uh, they just named a, uh, a, a historic build, uh, a center after her, a center uh, after her grandmother, uh, the Gertrude Keith Center in Kansas City, Missouri. So it's good. Now, Kansas City, th that is our national anthem, and I appreciate Senator Thompson uh, providing his, that history, because a lot of people get things confused and it makes people in, from Kansas City angry. Uh, and, <laughs> and so 
And so, you know, so you just, I mean, people will come up to me and say, well, how are things in Kansas? So, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't live in Kansas. I, I don't know why you're talking. And then, you know, people get so confused, even though we have universal free education in the United States. People, I mean, people will come up to me. I'm talking to educated people. And they say, well, now, were you the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas at the same time? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. Just like you could be mayor of Milwaukee and Miami at the same time. You know, uh, I mean, it's two different states. And, I, I, you know, people, uh, I mean, that, people get upset in Missouri because, you, know, uh, you know, somebody coming to you and say, well, how, where's Dorothy? You know. Now, Shanika lives in Missouri on 38th Street, but now we don't know nothing about Dorothy. You know, so I, I mean, it's just so it was so refreshing, Senator. Uh, and the reason that song was written by people who didn't live there is that Kansas City uh, in the 1930s on up to the 19, mid 1950s was uh, perhaps the most wide open city uh, in the United States, which is what gave birth to all this music. Count Basie is from Kansas City, Charlie Parker is from Kansas City. Big Joe Turner is from Kansas City. So this, uh, uh, this center of jazz just grew up because it was wide open. Uh, it was the second strongest mafia center in the country. Uh, Kansas City controlled Las Vegas uh, for the mob. Uh, and when Pretty Boy Floyd came to Kansas City uh, in 1954, I think, shot and killed three FBI agents and was given police protection for a week by the mayor of Kansas City. He wasn't arrested until a week later when they arrested him in Tennessee. Uh, to give you an idea how wide open uh, Kansas City was. And so, you know, if you, if you, if you were an entertainer, you, you, you never would reach anything unless you played in Kansas City. And uh, so we revi revitalized that. In fact, on the 13th, we'll have our, the second annual uh, American Jazz Walk of Fame honoring individuals. But I, I didn't come here to talk about uh, Kansas City. Um, I am coming to talk about the things that I think all of us uh, are concerned about. And, and those things are related to the future of the United States of America. And uh, I can tell you that the future of this country uh, depends uh, inseparably, uh, inextricably on uh, what the people in this room and people like you all over the country will be able to do. Um, I, I'm a fan of the great Robert Frost. I think he's, one, he's one, perhaps the greatest uh, writer of, of all times. Uh, he is a fabulous, he was a fabulous guy. If you don't know him well, uh, I, I encourage you to go and read anything that you can can write, uh, uh, can find about this uh, Pulitzer Prize winner. He, in fact, he has four. And Robert Frost uh, wrote 180 and a half poems before he died. 180, and uh, many of them were fabulous. In fact, he uh, was the first poet that a president used at the inauguration. Uh, and he, so he technically, I mean, not technically, but he, in fact, became uh, the port laureate of, of the country. And that lay, uh, paved the way for President Clinton to, to also bring in a port laureate who was Maya Angelou. Uh, and so uh, Robert Frost uh, is a fabulous person. If, you, if, if you're into reading uh, poetry, read him. Robert Lee Frost uh, was born in San Francisco. And uh, when you hear the quote, Good fences make good neighbors. And most people attribute those words to Robert Frost. Uh, and that's only because he, he uh, in his, uh, in a, one of the poems he wrote called Mending Fences, he says that. However, all he was doing was quoting what has been said a thousand times in a thousand cultures uh, for a thousand years in, in various ways. It was not new. Uh, but when I thought about it after I first began to uh, connect myself with Robert Frost, 
I thought, this is not right. Good fences don't make good neighbors. Good fences stand as the testimony that we can't be good neighbors. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. If we were good neighbors, we don't need a fence. Good fences make enemies. And in fact, I can't think of very many good things a, a wall or a fence will do. The Chinese, during the Ming Dynasty, built a wall around China 5,500.3 miles. 400,000 people died building that wall. Many of them are entombed inside the wall. There remains 5,000 5, miles. 26 feet high, 11 to 15 feet across. It, people say all the time, it is the only structure you can see from space. But they lie and they, you can't see it from space. It's, uh, and, but it sounds good, so keep telling people. Uh, no, I'm serious, keep telling people. Because uh, they don't know. They, they don't know, you, you, but you can't see it from space. There's, uh, you can't see the wall, you can see the oceans. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I, 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 I'm always thinking about when I think about the, the, China, the Chinese wall is the fact that it didn't, didn't do the Chinese too much good. The Chinese have been conquered by just about everybody. Everybody has gone over or around or through the wall of China. Uh, and they built this wall, and they considered themselves protecting themselves, uh, that nobody will be able to penetrate the Great Wall of China. Uh, but everybody has gone through it. Great Britain, France, Turkey, Japan twice. to defeat and then control China. So the wall didn't help them. Why in the world do we think walls are so good? We just stupidly spent billions of dollars to build a wall between Mexico and Texas to keep out some folk from God's country. I never have understood that God I, I, I heard somebody say one time, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, or, or what how it's interpreted is, and everything that's in it. And so, you know, we're going to wall off, go, somebody come in your house and, and build it and, 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 and divide a room in your house. In your house. And that's what we've done. You know, we, we, we wouldn't have so many problems in this country if the Indians had had better Im immigration policies. I mean, how dare, how dare somebody whose great-great-grandmama and great-great-granddaddy came into this country and all of a sudden we, we don't, well, no, we don't want anybody uh, in, especially people that don't look like those of us who've already been in for a long time. And African Americans, we can't get caught up in that. Let me tell you why. What you, don't re what you don't, uh, may not know, unless you start reading all of the, 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 the issues surrounding immigration, it's also restricting people coming in from Africa. And the Caribbean. And the Caribbean. And see, and I, 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 I I don't believe in violence. I, should, I wanted to slap a man. Uh, st uh, 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 black man stood up telling me, we, we got to stop them. Stop them who? 
the black people coming from Tanzania, Kenya, Haiti. And so we, we can't get caught up in this. Or we end up fighting against our own self-interest. And so we built these walls and we have continued to, to build walls uh, over and over again. In fact, the human race seems to be perpetual wall builders. I, mean, I have twin boys. And we go, uh, I'm from, I was born and raised in Texas, so we drive, make that trip to Texas uh, a couple of times a year. And every parent in here with more than one child can identify this. Uh, Daddy, uh, he touched me. <laughs> da Daddy, he's scooting over here on my side. Am I making it up? No. no. So I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, I drew a line down the, uh, the seat. And he crossed over to my line. Now these are kids, that, and, and all of a sudden they, they built a wall in the back seat of my car. Make no house, no car payments, and, 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 and I, I drew a line. I mean, that, that's an example of, of, of how human beings seem to always want to build a wall. We're constantly building walls, walls of, of confusion. We love walls of confusion, and, and the immigration issue is just one. Uh, this, this, this. Do you know that people can use language and build a wall and then get the people who are being walled out to help build it? Let me explain. I listen to some of my friends on the other side of the aisle say things like, uh, well, uh, I'm against the death tax. And then I look up and some poor folk, I know I'm against the death tax. I mean, what, what they mean is they're against death because they have no idea. I mean, I'm against death too. I, I mean, but... But, but, and so they just, all they, all they did is connect it up with the word death, and the people who, who, who designed it knew that we'd have some suckers. Now, here, here, here's, it, it's called the estate tax. It's a wall of confusion. So uh, they turned the country against uh, the estate tax because they call it the death tax. Now, it, what, here's what it means, and I don't, I know it was about 25 or 30 rich people in here. I mean, it, <laughs> Listen to this. this. Listen to this. The only way you have to pay, pay taxes uh, on what you inherit is if it's over five million dollars. In some places, three. But it's, but, but now, and so here's somebody broke, <laughs> broke. So I, 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 I'm against the death tax got 98 cents in the bank and he's going to be against the death tax. I mean, walls of confusion. They, 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 they do it all the time. And then we, we fall for it. And, then, and fight against our best interest when we do so. You know, uh, my state of Missouri, which is, you know, Elsa Hastings, got in, I mean, got uh, got on all the late night shows. Uh, he's on he's on the rules committee. Nothing comes to the floor what it shouldn't, uh, as you know, Senator. Comes to the floor unless it goes through the rules committee. So it's supposed to be the most powerful committee because you can't get any legislation on the floor to be voted on because uh, they've figured out ways to, to maneuver and get around that, but. One of the things that uh, uh, Alison Hastings said in the Rules Committee that ended up on all of the late night shows and it was uh, just it exploded all over the world is uh, we had a, and the guy uh, who, who got beat up uh, has an office next to mine. And uh, so Alison Hastings told him that, uh, you know, he said, I wouldn't live in Texas uh, if, it was the, if it was the only state we had. 
and uh, and and he said, uh, you know, uh, it's a crazy place, uh, and it is. Uh, and I was born there. I was born, and raised, and I graduated from Prairie View. I mean, it's it's uh, it's. It, uh, but Al Hayson was right. So was my state of Missouri. Walls of confusion. Here, here, let me show you what happened. People would uh, come to Washington and they would protest uh, the Affordable Care Act. Now, so the, the, the Kentucky governor uh, figured out that the people were, were crazy. So what did he do? He renamed it in Kentucky, and everybody just went crazy uh, adjoining. And then people were standing in line to sign up and say, now, I'm, this is better than that Obamacare. The same thing with another name. And then you got places like Florida. Now, now walk with me now. Walk with me. Don't, don't stop walking with me now. Because Missouri's in the same bag. The Missouri General Assembly on Monday morning could take 30 minutes and give 300,000 Missourians insurance who don't have it. 300,000. And most of them are not black or brown. All they have to do is expand Medicaid. Medicare. That's all they have to do. And you don't know how much money it will cost the state of Florida if they did it? Zero. Zero. Walls and confusion. And many of the people who don't have insurance are supporting the people who won't give it to them. <laughs> About five weeks ago, I was called to a meeting along with the chair of our committee. I'm a ranking member and uh, the the ranking member of the overall committee is Maxine Waters, and I, I'm a ranking member over the, over the housing, over the HUD oversight committee. So we're called to a, a meeting of the Democratic caucus of, of our committee, which is essentially the banking committee. So we go to the meeting, and all of us are sitting there listening to all these people ask us to help them preserve the XM bank, the export-import bank. I don't want to get into defining it, except that it helps people who want to do business overseas to have United States guaranteeing that they'll get paid if they do business in Colombia and the Colombians don't want to pay them. So I'm sitting there and out in front of us asking us to do this is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, all kinds of business leaders from all of the big banks. And I sat there and I'm thinking, what these people are asking us to do is to come, go and try to stop the people they put in office from hurting them. Because the same, those same people, the U.S. Chamber and all of these conservative groups, what do they want? They want the XM Bank. We're for it. They want immigration. We're for it. They want a transportation bill. We're for it. Almost all of the things they want, we are for. So they go out and give money to a group of folk and then come to us and say, please stop the people we just gave that money to and go give it to them again in another two years. Well, you're not walking with me now. Now walk with me now. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. It is crazy. And we can't afford to join anybody in discriminating against anybody. I have my, my cousin, I have a, co uh, a lot of people uh, know my because he's dead, and his name is Eldridge Cleaver, and Eldridge, uh, you know, was one of the top five Black Panthers uh, in the day, and uh, wrote a, wrote a uh, million dollar book called Soul on Ice, but Eldridge, uh, uh, Eldridge's wife, Kathleen, after, after Eldridge died, went to, went to school, got her degree, then went on to law school, got her law degree, and now she teaches law at Emory in Atlanta and just finished doing a semester at Howard teaching in the, uh, in the Harvard uh, 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 School of Law. But I was uh, talking with her a couple of weeks ago and she said, I just want to tell you, you got a new little cousin, uh, 
and she said, my, my grandson. And I said, oh, my goodness, I can't wait to get back to Atlanta so I get a chance to see him. And, I, and so I said, um, so what's his name? And she said, oh, his name is uh, Mohammed Cleaver. Said, Kathleen, have you lost your mind? <laughs> have you lost your black mind? Look here, let me tell you something. This boy gonna get discriminated against because his name is Mohammed, and then Cleaver. I know. I know. I was on the, the watch list. We can't we can't discriminate against anybody. Now, one of the one of the things that uh, I think we have to to think about uh, is this wall of hostility that has also been been built between African Americans and uh, the police. Uh, now I've seen uh, Val Demings on, on, on national TV shows talking about this issue and she is quite uh, eloquent uh, in, in, in discussing this and, and I, I am I'm always pleased when I see her on these talk shows. Uh, but I, I'm from Missouri. We have a little town called Ferguson. Uh, and and what, you, what is important for you to understand is that the Civil Rights Movement bypassed Ferguson. It's a town that's still in the 1960s. Think about this, Chief. 22,000 people live in Ferguson. Last year, they issued 33,000 traffic warrants. That's one warrant per person plus visitors. <laughs> and they did so because what they're doing is policing for profit. And anytime you, you create this conflict between the police and the citizens, because everybody knows you're going to you know, uh, that they're trying to give you a ticket. I grew up in, in Texas, right? Uh, I was born in a little place right outside of downtown Dallas called Waxhatchee. And every time when, when my mother and father would take my three sisters and, and me out driving on Sunday afternoon, we couldn't go anywhere else, so we used to drive on Sundays. I know you are too affluent to know about that. <laughs> but uh, that's what we used to do on Sundays. And we'd go through a little town called Saginaw. My mama would say, now, honey, slow down. Because in Saginaw, you'll get a ticket in a minute because a lot of these little towns designed their municipal budgets around traffic tickets. And so that's what Ferguson has been doing. And, uh, you know, and so you're bound to have some problems. And Ferguson is so small, you could have, uh, you know, community policing. Uh, here, here's, a, here's the deal. Uh, our church is located in what people call, say is a bad neighborhood. Our church has never been broken into. Never been broken into as of tonight. And maybe somebody will break into it tonight, but uh, <laughs> nobody's, nobody's ever broken into the church. You know why? So I've been there 38 years, so I know all the kids. And, and we've helped half the kids over there, and so the word is out in there, don't, uh, hey, don't, don't go over there and mess with the church. You know, you can go break in some houses and stuff down the street. <laughs> don't, 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 don't mess with the church, because on Wednesday nights, sometimes the, 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 we have a block and a half of people standing in line coming through the church to get food. And so we don't get broken into. And I know these kids, the, everybody in town scared of them. I know them. Will they really get out of the street? And so what I was... <laughs> What, what I, what I, and, I, and I know their grandmothers. Just think about this. You have a community uh, design policing operation in Ferguson. Michael Brown's walking in the street, and the police officer, Michael, get out of the street, man. Come on, get out of the street. I don't have to go tell your mother. Get out of the street. Come on, man. Don't start that cussing, Michael. Come on, I don't want to have to arrest you. Man, I know your mom and daddy. Get out of the street. It's a whole different world. It's a whole different world if you know these folk. But if, it, if you give the impression 
that you are a part of an occupying force patrolling occupied territory, there is hostility. This wall of hostility begins to grow. And we, we have a situation now where we're trying to get uh, some reform, uh, some judicial reform. John Conyers has been working on it for uh, two or three decades, trying to get some kind of reform. Uh, I met with John Boehner, with, along with a colleague of mine, Al Green, two weeks ago, uh, and it looks like we are, we are probably going to pass something, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the next uh, 10 uh, to 15 days, uh, which would essentially uh, require every police department to have uh, body, cam body cameras. And, uh, uh, I mean, that doesn't solve the, every, all of the problems. Uh, but it goes a long way. It, go, it protects good police officers. I mean, I was the mayor of the city, hired the police chief, and, and, and was over the police department. Uh, we had a 12-year-old boy shot about 20-something times. I can't remember now. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the black civil rights leaders came down and said, Mayor, you know, we, we, I want you to, we want you to fire all the police officers. Uh, well, so I said, well, uh, sit down, let me tell you what, 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 what's going on. I said, you see nobody's mad in the boy's family because he was delivering drugs for his uncle and driving a car. Police tell him to stop. His uncle's giving him a little gun. He brings the gun up. What, what I mean? Now, we also, you know, have to be a little more insistent on our children doing the right thing. And, you know, I, I mean, I, uh, you know, people can, can, can say whatever they want to say uh, about a football player, let's just say hypothetically, uh, who spanked his children maybe too hard, Maybe, it, 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 just hypothetically, I'm talking about it. Any, anybody. But I grew up in Texas. My daddy would say to me, go get a switch. Now, the little twigs didn't work. He sent me right back. Now, uh, my daddy told my three sisters, I mean, now they didn't hardly get in the in spankers, to be honest. They, they tried to act like it, but uh, it was just me. <laughs> and my, my dad said, okay, y'all call the police on me if you want to. They better, they better give me the chair. <laughs> and we knew it. I, when I was growing up, they, we, we got a little old black and white TV. I lived in public housing for a while, uh-huh. Uh, we had an old black white, and white TV, and so they had a show called Father Knows Best. And I remember we had one TV in the house, so all of us are sitting around watching the TV, watching Father Knows Best. So the little girl, Kathy, uh, gets mad at her daddy. She runs up and closes the door, and her daddy's don't be no door. Uh, Kathy opened the door. My three sisters and I went to bed. We didn't want our daddy to know we saw it. I mean, we, I mean, that was, you know, I mean, we, hey, we, we ain't got nothing to do with this. <laughs> and, and one of the problems is that t t uh, in some ways TV has given a, a, a vision of the black family that has never been real. <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, <laughs> talking back, I mean, let me, let me t I have three boys. And I told him, I said, look, you can, you know, I, 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 be, be sure. You ever talk back to me or your mother? I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to shoot you in the leg. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to go to work every day? 
when you're sick, getting up all times of day and night trying to take care of a baby with a temperature and they get up and, they, and they're going to curse you? Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh-uh. That, that's, that's, that. And that, that was my daddy's attitude. Still is. My dad is 92. And I still, I still honor him. Now, I need to say this. I'm going to go home over to my seat. Look, Democrats must be wall bangers. Wall bangers. I go into the Sunday school class one Sunday, and I began to ask the, ch the kids in this particular class questions. I just wanted to see where, where they were in terms of their Sunday school lesson. So um, the teacher steps aside, and I, and I said, Lamar, um, why don't you stand up and tell me uh, who uh, knocked down the wall of Jericho? And he said, Reverend, I didn't do it. When I got off the church bus, I came straight in. <laughs> He said, he said, I know I got a bad reputation here at the church, but I, I didn't do it. <laughs> so I said, what? And I turned around to the teachers. I said, did you hear that? And she said, he didn't do it. She said, I was at the door. She said, I was at the door when he got off the bus, Reverend. He came straight in. So I, I'm, I'm a United Methodist pastor. I, I'm, I'm, I, I serve under real bishops. Uh, I, 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 hey, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm just, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, is, is our bishops can, 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 can appoint and disappoint. Uh, so I'm thinking, hey, I'm getting ready to get moved. As soon as this gets out, uh, you know, my, my, my kids and the teacher, so I thought I can protect myself. So I went to the church administrative board meeting and I, I, I said, I'm, I, you know, I hope I don't have to retire or resign or get out of here. I said, because we got a serious program, a problem in the Sunday school. And uh, so chairman of the board said, what, what's going on? I said, I said look, man, I, I, I go to the room and I, and I asked Lamar about the Jericho wall. He said he didn't knock it down. And, and then I said, and the worst part, ladies and gentlemen, is that the teacher corroborated the story. <laughs> so the chairman said, well, we don't care who knocked down the wall, Reverend, so we're going to pay for it. So that's... <laughs> what we want it's for people to know that Democrats are the ones knocking down the walls. The walls that separate people on the basis of language and skin color, we're knocking down the walls. The walls that separate the older people in our country who are not able to go in comfort that they're going to have their social security and not have it put in some kind of trust fund on Wall Street, we are knocking down those walls. We are Democrats. We are wall bangers. We knock down walls. We don't build up walls. We're not down laws. That's who we are. We are wall bangers.